Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by myself, Alera Oromoloi, uh, legal advisor, Lisa, and a solicitor. I have muted everyone's phones, but feel free to send in questions. You can type in your questions in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, and they will be taken at the end of the webinar. It's, it's scheduled to last an hour. I'm just going to read um, the disclaimer, which should come up on the next Sorry, I'm just trying to get to the next screen. Yes. So whilst we make reasonable efforts to ensure our content is accurate and up to date, information and guidance in this webinar does not and is not intended to amount to legal advice in any particular case. No responsibility for any consequence of relying upon the webinar material or presentations of the webinar is assumed by Lee or any of our advisors. And this is a law stated um, as of the 20th of September, 2016. Um, now, with today's webinar is actually entitled Right to Manage Part 2. I'm not sure how many people listening in today attended the or heard the webinar that was recorded on the 8th of September, where we sort of considered, um, you know, right to manage itself, getting ready for the right to manage, serving the various uh, notices, notice inviting participation and claim notice. And also we had a discussion about qualifying criteria and eligibility. So we're moving on from that now to sort of um, our le learning objectives, which I shall uh, that are referred to in the next slide. So at the end of this training, the intention is that you would have gained some knowledge about negative counter notices, applying to the appropriate tribunal, gathering information, getting uncommitted service charges, the management functions of the RTM once it's acquired, costs of proceedings, and when the right to manage um, is terminated. So these are all the things that we're going to be talking about today. You can see that it's going to be a chock-a-block hour um, in, in this part of uh, the session today. Now, just a run-through of the relevant legislation that um, sort of um, right to manage um, comes under. It's, again, statutory authorities derived uh, from the 2002 Common Hold and Release of Reform Act, and then you have various uh, prescribed particulars and forms. Now, there is a distinction there. If the right to manage is to be acquired in Wales, then there are the relevant regulations for Wales and model articles as well. And if it's in England, then you've got the uh, corresponding regulations and model articles. Also, if there is, um, you know, if the matter does get contentious and applications would have to be made, then in England it's to the tribunal, um, property for the, sorry, the first year tribunal property chamber, and if it's in Wales, it would be the lethal valuation tribunal. And those are the just uh, mentioned there of the rules that accompany those um, applications to the various tribunals. Now, um, again, I'm just sort of, um, I suppose, carrying on from what we discussed before. Um, and this part of the discussion um, discusses, that, well, we're sort of looking at the counter notice. Um, it is set out in Section 84 in terms of the requirements, and there is a prescribed form uh, for the purpose, which is set out in, in Schedule 4 of the regulations. Um, what tends to happen when a counter notice is served is that the landlord is either sort of, uh, well, let's go back a step. So uh, in the claim notice itself, uh, the right to manage company would have indicated a date by which the claim note, the counter notice ought to be served, usually uh, 30 days after uh, receipt of the claim notice. And then the landlord would then have to respond by that date. And if there isn't a response, then there will be consequences that flow. So we will be looking at those as we go ahead in the slides. But just suffice it to say that provision for the counter notice is made in Section 84 of the 2002 Act. Um, must be sort of um, returned, if you like, to the uh, RTM company by the date that is specified in the claim notice. And it's not mandatory, actually, to um, serve a counter notice, but we will be looking at the consequences of failure to do one uh, as we go along in the slides. Now, why would a uh, landlord seek to object to the right to manage? I mean, there might be all sorts of grounds. Uh, there are statutory grounds, you know, where the, the landlord says, well, sorry, your building doesn't qualify, um, or you haven't qualified with, you haven't complied with legislative requirements, or that the membership, you know, if you, if you remember from uh, the RTM Part 1 webinar, we looked at eligibility, qualification, and all that, you know, membership, uh, and all this sort of concern. So, 
you know, these are grounds that uh, could fuel a landlord's objections where, um, you know, the RGM has failed in one respect or the other um, to sort of um, comply with statutory requirements or, or, or even uh, the fact that the building itself is not a qualifying building for the purpose. Again, why would a landlord choose to, to object? I think it's a valid question, uh, certainly one we always get here at the Leasehold Advisory Service. But, you know, the landlord, particularly the landlord, a resident landlord, and the building isn't exempt. Uh, you know, there are certain uh, resident landlord exceptions that apply to the right to manage. But if this wasn't one of them, the landlord, you know, may be really upset at the fact that, you know, the leaseholders have decided to sort of wrest management away from them. Or that, you know, if you've got a one block in a development of a few and, you know, one block decides, okay, we're going to go for the right to manage, the others are not sort of interested, then you're going to have a sort of dual management uh, by the RTM for the, the, the building that they're responsible for and the landlord for the, the other blocks in the, in the development. And then you may have a scenario, you know, similar to what we saw with the Galley Unity case where the landlord and the RTM retained management functions over communal grounds. So there could be all that kind of uh, confusion that could arise where not everyone in an estate is, is keen to take over the right to manage. Also, the landlord may just want to avoid disruption. You know, things are moving on smoothly. Sometimes you do get the scenario where one particular leaseholder, you know, they're aggrieved by the landlord, decides to whip up, you know, the sentiment, excuse me, of others, and, and perhaps right to manage is not really suited to that development. But you know, if, if, if a leaseholder can whip up enough um, sentiment, they might, you know, leaseholders might find themselves carried on, you know, the wave of the right to manage where it's really not uh, the best management uh, option for them. But there are, I suppose, a variety of reasons why um, landlords may oppose the right to manage. Uh, again, without being too cynical, um, you know, sort of there have been instances where leaseholders have complained, say, for example, about, you know, the insurance costs because the landlord is getting a commission. And if right to manage is acquired, that might be, you know, a loss of income, you know, all of a sudden to the landlord. So, again, you know, you can understand where landlords get quite uh, uh, sort of uh, not very happy with, with the proposal of, of a right to manage. Now... Um, there isn't a requirement, as I said, to serve a counter notice. It's not mandatory, but it's always a good idea if um, a, a, a landlord was seeking to raise some form of objection. So what the landlord in those circumstances would do would be for them to serve a counter notice opposing the acquisition of right to manage and disputing the validity of the claim notice that counter notice would then be served without prejudice to the contention that because the claim notice is invalid, there's no requirement to serve a counter notice at all. So in other words, what I'm getting at is that, you know, landlord is better placed to serve a counter notice, um, you know, opposing acquisition and then relying on, on, on a proposal that, look, although um, we've served this, there's no requirement to serve it at all and it's served without prejudice because we consider that the claim notice is invalid. In other words, if the claim notice is invalid, then there's really nothing to serve a counter notice uh, against. But it's always best, uh, I think, if your landlord's seeking to object to serve that counter notice anyway albeit without prejudice. Uh, as I said, there isn't a requirement to serve it, but it's always a good idea to serve it if the intention is to challenge validity of, of the claim notice. Now, a few cases then. We'll just be looking at those in a little bit more detail. This sort of, um, I suppose, that the, the challenge where uh, the right to manage company alleged that um, a negative counter notice had been served and whether or not um, that would sort of, um, you know, if, if your counter notice is really negative, it's not sort of uh, doing what it should, which is to sort of um, challenge successfully entitlement of the right to manage, what would be the consequence of that? Now, it's a Joined appeals these cases in Stevens Mansions and um, St James's Mansions. Um, same sort of uh, landlords and, and, and um, uh, named property uh, property uh, mansion agents uh, in the leases. What had happened was in this particular case, you had sort of development that comprised two adjoining blocks of flats, 
uh, there's a pump house on the estate which, you know, sort of um, housed the water pump equipment. So through that system, you know, quite a sort of um, a complicated one, I suppose, in a way. Um, but the water pump was designed to serve both of the buildings. Through, uh, and so you had a sort of, with, with the maze of pipes, you had a single sort of outflow pipe, which divided and then re-entered into each building um, separate, you know, sort of separately, and, and sort of served both, although uh, the main source was from this water pump. So there were all sorts of arguments in which we will be considering, as I said, about whether or not um, uh, the claim notice had been validly served and whether or not the counter notices in, in the appeals were, were valid as well. And what had happened in the sort of, if we take the sort of uh, St. James's Mansions case as a starting point, um, Basically, the, the right to manage company alleged that the counter notice um, served um, by the landlord and the uh, named property management company um, was defective because what they had done was they had referred to, um, in terms of their objection to the right to manage, they'd referred to the building at St. Stephen's uh, Mansions rather than St. James Mansions. Uh, but it was obvious from all the correspondence and, all, and the cover letter that preceded the sort of uh, counter notice that the reference was really to St. James Mansions rather than to St. Stephen's. But then when the landlord's uh, solicitors came to complete the counter notice, they inserted into the, um, you know, the sort of uh, name of the RTM, St. James Mansions, rather than St. Stephen's Mansion. So um, this went to, um, you know, part of a series of, of, uh, of challenges. The landlord was challenging, uh, you know, entitlement uh, to right to manage in the first instance. And then when it went on appeal, right to manage company was saying, well, actually, um, landlord, because your counter notice is, is, is invalid, um, your objections about validity of our claim notice, you know, just be swept away. And uh, what the upper tribunal held was that although there was an error in the counter notice, this error being the reference to uh, St. Stephen's Mansions rather than St. James Mansions, that error was minor and obvious. It was clear from anybody who was looking at that counter notice that what the landlord meant to uh, refer to was St. James rather than St. Stephen's. All the correspondence, the cover letter, everything else indicated that um, the, the focal point of the counter notice was actually St. James as opposed to St. Stephen. And then in that decision, the upper tribunal judge applied, you know, this sort of mani test. What would a reasonable person uh, receiving that notice, what would they make of it, armed with all the knowledge and circumstances of the case? And then a reasonable recipient would have understood that the reference in that counter notice was really to send James Mansions rather than to what was actually inserted into uh, the counter notice itself, which was send James. So the upper tribunal said, look, there's such a minor and obvious error. And the re reasonable recipient test would apply when uh, one was looking at a counter notice. And because of that application, this um, counter notice was a valid one as opposed to being an invalid one. Now, when again, just um, uh, just giving you some a, a bit of reference there to the Manai decision, which applies to defects generally in notices. But then we've got this sort of decision saying that defects in, 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 in notices um, under the Manai uh, rule would also sort of apply to counter notices counter notices in, 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 as part of the right to manage process. Now, with the um, uh, St. Stephen's case, remember that the, the, these buildings were adjoining buildings. What the landlord had sought to argue was that um, this wasn't, uh, because, you know, the right to manage can be exercised by a building as a whole or as a, a, a part of a building. So you can have a self-contained building exercising the right to manage or part of a building with or without a settlement property exercising the right to manage. And, and this is found in Section 72 of the Act. Now, when you look a little bit Bit more in the detail of Section 72. If you're looking at a part of a building which was considering the right to manage, it's got to constitute a vertical division, and the structure of the building is such that it could be redeveloped independently. So although the buildings were adjoining each other, each part of the building had decided to serve a, a, a right to manage claim notice. Also, remember what I said earlier on about this water pump that served both buildings, and the landlord tried to argue that, look, because you've got this water pump, 
servicing both buildings. And in their opinion, the works that would be designed uh, to separate the, the, the um, supply of the water would be so significant, it would cause such an interruption that the right to manage couldn't possibly be achieved because you wouldn't then satisfy the tests about, um, you know, sort of uh, providing services, um, you know, independently. And even if you had to modify uh, the provision of those uh, services, then you wouldn't have to do it in a way that would result in a significant interruption. And so the landlord was saying, look, St. Stephen's Mansion, they wouldn't be entitled to the right to manage because of this water pump that served uh, both buildings. And the upper tribunal said that, well, actually, you've got to look at this from the point of view of what would be the, um, the works that would be required and whether or not those works would require significant interruption in the services to either of the buildings. In, with, with all the evidence that they got from surveyors and all that, you know, about what works would be required to the water pumps, the, right, the upper tribunal said, well, relatively simple to provide, you know, separate storage tank, uh, metering facilities and all that. And so in light of that, just go back to the slide so we can round it up, um, the, um, the, the sort of landlord's objections were not sustained. So again, just be aware of, you know, if you're serving a negative counter notice, um, you know, what would be the, uh, the sort of, um, what, what could be issues um, that could be sort of uh, raised, you know, in this particular one, um, you know, there was this objection about, you know, works that were required, especially if you're looking at parts of a building seeking to exercise the right to manage. I mean, in this case, uh, St. Stephen's Mansion and St. James's Mansion, the right to manage companies were successful. But there could be arguments where, um, you know, if a, if a landlord is able to successfully resist the right to manage on the basis that, look, you've got adjoining buildings, um, although they, they sort of, uh, if they've got common facilities serving both, then what is the level of work that is required to separate those common services so that, um, you know, the, without causing a significant interruption, uh, and that could determine whether or not uh, the right to manage could be resisted or, or acquired in the circumstances. Now, we're just going to be looking at a uh, late counter notice. There is a strict time limit, as I said. Remember what I said at the beginning about, you know, the counter notice itself um, would be given by the date that is specified in the claim notice. Usually a 30-day period is given for uh, receipt of that counter notice. The time limits are very strict. Uh, tribunals don't have the power to extend the time limits given, and, and this case of uh, Gateway Property Holdings is proof of that, you know, a case where the tribunal had said, albeit obita for that particular point, that a late counter notice could not be entertained by the tribunal if it was served out of time. So this is just, you know, reference there to that point. But I think more significantly, this case sort of ties in with the next slide, which I will go to now, about uh, when you apply to the tribunal. And then I'll just, you know, jump in and out of those two slides because they sort of tie with each other. So in this case of, um, just go back to it so you can see the, the case reference. It's, um, you know, this Gateway Property Holdings case. What had happened was the landlord gave a counter notice on the 3rd of August 2010. The right to manage company had two months from receipt of the counter notice to apply to the tribunal. This was the LVT at the time. Um, and the time to apply to the LVT would have ended on the 2nd of October, you know, the two month period to apply to LVT. They then, the landlord, the, the right to manage company, then faxed an application to the tribunal on the 1st of October 2010, but the faxed application didn't contain any of the prescribed information, you know, and material. So you would have had to serve with your application, you know, copies of the notice copies of the claim notice, and all the information that was required to be um, a, um, to, to accompany uh, the application to the tribunal. So all that was missing. And then they had, what they've done was, so that was faxed on the 1st of October, and then they posted the hard copy, still sort of, you know, a hard copy without uh, all the required information, that arrived uh, to the tribunal on the 4th of October. So the, um, you know, the landlord then argued, look, um, you know, there is a time limit here. The RTM, have, you know, they failed to make the application to the tribunal on time, although the tribunal accepted that the fax 
um, application form was, was, was um, uh, they could sort of send in a fax one and they would, were prepared to accept it. They then decided, a tribunal of its own volition, decided then to sort of, you, you know, it, as part of the rules at the time, obviously not the rules that we have in England, you know, the first tribunal property chamber rules. This is part of the leasehold valuation tribunal rules, procedural rules, that we're going to rely on, on, on one of the saving provisions and entertain the application. And the upper tribunal said no. Um, you know, if, if an application is sent, to the um, tribunal for consideration, then if it's not properly sent and it's not sent within the time frame, it can't be entertained by the tribunal. So in this particular case, um, the failure to apply to the tribunal on time um, is critical. And so uh, if, you, if you sort of, you know, even if you're going to send in a fax application, just, you know, sort of dead on, the, on that deadline, you've got to make sure that it's properly sent with all the right information. I mean, in that particular one, I think what they sent was, um, you know, the names of the parties and the representative. No copy of the claim notice, no copy of the counter notice. And so in those circumstances, the tribunal, upper tribunal said, well, no, this was insufficient information that was supplied. The tribunal couldn't have dealt with the matter. And so um, the uh, right to manage uh, lost its, its opportunity, um, if you like, to, to um, to sort of challenge or resist the landlord's challenge of uh, of their uh, claim notice. So again, just be aware of the importance of, uh, of the deadlines. And as I said, um, you know, you've got two months to um, uh, sort of, if you're acting for, for a rights management company, to apply to the tribunal where a negative counter notice has been received. Two months from receipt of that negative counter notice. Again, so we're just going to be considering now, um, you know, what applications are made to the tribunal and what happens with that. So if an application is made to the tribunal, it does suspend the acquisition date. I mean, this can be a tactical ploy, I suppose, by landlords who want to resist right to manage. Uh, some of you who heard the, uh, the, the part one uh, webinar on the 8th of September may recall that I referred you to some cases where the right to manage company was challenged on the basis that when the company was in Incorporated, they forgot to put right to manage in the name of the company. And so because of that, uh, you know, the, the, okay, the tribunal said, well, sorry, that's not a valid challenge, but it was a challenge nonetheless, and it delayed the um, acquisition date. So generally what tends to happen with that is that if a challenge is made, then the acquisition date is delayed until the um, application is finally disposed of by the tribunal or the parties come to agreement. Um, usually an application becomes um, final if it's not appealed against at the end of the period for bringing an appeal, or if it is appealed against uh, at the time when the appeal is disposed of. So again, you've got to think about that um, if the landlord does challenge the right to manage uh, validity or entitlement or whatever else, then, you know, again, the, the date is just um, delayed for further three months until when everything is ended, and it might take six or nine months. Sometimes parties can agree. So the landlord can say, do you know what, I'm happy to, um, you know, drop my claim, the right to manage can be acquired uh, because I'm not resisting it any longer. It's three months from that date of agreement. So again, I suppose uh, the point I'm making is that although um, you know it's envisaged in, in the 2002 Act that rights managed will be acquired uh, within three months of the date that is set out in the claim notice, which is well, four months in total because you have to give the landlord a month to come back with their counter notice, that date can be suspended if a uh, landlord resists by making an application to tribunal or the, the landlord does, the changes their mind when um, uh, and they agree at date, then it's a further three months added on to that. Uh, there are cost powers that the tribunal have, and we'll be looking at that um, as we go further in the slide. Now, let's just assume that everything has gone on smoothly and the right to manage is acquired on the date that is set out in the claim notice. What the right to manage company is then entitled to do once they've acquired the right is that they can serve a notice um, requiring information um, in, in connection with the management of the building. So it might be that they want to know about um, 
what is a service charge position? We want all the copies of leases that you're aware of, particularly if you just imagine if you've got, you know, quite a number of flats in the building, uh, you know, people may not have copies of their leases or whatever else. Um, so, again, we want to know what's going on. Who owes what? Are you going to be, um, you know, chasing people to arrears or are there service charges that need to be paid out post-acquisition? So, all sorts of information can come to light. What's important, though, is that this notice that, uh, you know, sort of is served by the right to manage requiring information cannot be served on the landlord or um, before the acquisition date. Okay, it's usually after the acquisition date that the notice can be served. I did have an inquiry the other day where um, the leaseholders had set up a right to manage and they served the sort of notice under Section 93. Um, yes, they were going to acquire the right, I think, in June, and they served the, the notice requiring information under Section 93 in about May. And I said, well, no. Technically, the landlord didn't have to respond because that notice was served before the acquisition date. If it is served properly by the right date, then the landlord does have to respond within 28 days of receipt of it. And if they don't, then a default notice can be served. Usually, you give them 14 days to comply with the request. Um, if they haven't complied within that 14-day period, then it's a matter of going to the county court. And if a, a, a claim is made successfully against the landlord, uh, the landlord could find themselves landed with costs. Um, and if they don't sort of, you know, if they sort of get a you know, judgment against them and they ignore it and think, well, we don't really care about the rights to manage, then you can imagine you know, someone just <laughs> asking for a penal notice and then even uh, proceeding for, con for contempt. So clearly these things are quite important and they must be complied with. But you know, there you go, you can serve the default notice where the landlord fails to uh, provide that post acquisition information that you know, right to manage reasonably requires in order to carry out its management functions. Uh, there's a note there about Section 83. It's a bit premature. I would just ignore that for now. Uh, sorry about that. But it really relates to rights of access for inspection. That's before the claim notice is served, where the rights manage company can serve a notice under Section 83 saying to the landlord, we would require access um, perhaps uh, to, to, to inspect something or the other um, and, and decide whether or not you know, this would help our claim, you know, acquiring the, the right to manage itself. But we're looking more here at post-acquisition. We've got the right to manage now. We need to know what's going on with the, with the state of the building and all sorts of things. Now, there are contractor notices um, that the landlord has to serve and contract notices. Now, the contractor notices, uh, they're not prescribed in England. So I think what would happen if you're serving these notices would be to look at the statutory provisions themselves, sections 91 and 92, as it sets out in the slide. Uh, to see what are the, you know, what kinds of things can you, or should you be including in those contractor notices and contract notices? Now, the contractor notices would usually be served on contractors who perhaps their landlord or their managing agents have appointed to carry out works or services to the building. So you can imagine, you know, before the right to manage is exercised, the landlord is obviously going on about, excuse me, going about their business. They've engaged contractors to provide gardening, cleaning, whatever else, repairs. And all of a sudden, the right to manage comes on board. So the contractors would have to be made aware of the um, impending right to manage acquisition um, and, and obviously decide whether or not they want to lobby with the, you know, sort of lobby the right to manage company to say, well, okay, um, you know, the, the, the um, uh, managing agents or the landlord are no longer able to contract with us. We would like to, you know, sort of carry on the business with the right to manage company. So it's only fair that the uh, contractors are made aware of, of right to manage and obviously what the next steps would be in terms of uh, their position. Also, the contract notices, again, really sort of giving the right to manage company information about the contracts that are existing, you know, service maintenance contracts, things like that, so that the right to manage company then decides, okay, do we want to keep these contracts, perhaps for continuity until we make up our minds uh, that we want to invite other people to tender, or are we just going to just ditch them and say, well, sorry, we're not interested, you know, we found them too expensive in the first place anyway, so this would be perfect opportunity. Uh, to sort of, uh, you know, sort of get rid of those um, contracts and not be bothered with them. So again, uh, just be aware of uh, the, the sort of um, the statutory um, 
requirements to serve um, contractor notices and contract notices on the right to manage company uh, if you're acting uh, for a landlord who's in receipt of uh, a right to manage claim. Uh, as I said, those notices are not prescribed in England, in, in England, but they are prescribed in Wales. So I think looking and, and there will be sort of, you know, I imagine OEA and, and people, you know, people who provide these types of forms would have prepared, you know, sort of a precedent uh, forms that you can you can obtain. Now, again, when are these notices served? And again, if I think statute is it's interesting the way that it sort of says on the determination date or as soon as reasonably practicable thereafter. So the determination date would, uh, remember what we said in your claim notice, if you're acting for the, uh, the right to manage company, you would have put a date in the notice when the right to manage would be acquired. And that would usually be about three months following on from receipt of the counter notice. But if there has been a dispute about you know, validity or entitlement, then it's three months from when that appeal, if it goes to tribunal, is disposed of, or if the landlord, you know, there's been all that uh, disagreement and the landlord then concedes and says, okay, I give up, you're entitled to the right to manage, then it's really when um, three months again from that date when the landlord has conceded or agreed that the right to manage can acquire the right. So again, um, your, the, the right to serve these notices will depend on what the determination date is. Uh, and as I said, it's really sort of either the date in the, in the claim notice where that's not objected or if it is objected where a tribunal has finally disposed of a matter, and the matter is finally disposed of when all the rights of appeal have been exhausted. So three months on from that date, depending on obviously on which one would apply in your circumstance. Now, it's interesting with frustration of contracts with the right to manage. There isn't any sort of authority on the point, but I think a lot of uh, sort of leading leasehold specialists have said that, look, um, the right to manage as a concept, they imagine or, or they sort of see no ground for, for, for taking a different view, uh, but they think that it would frustrate existing contracts. Um, and so with the Obviously, that's quite an important uh, point, I suppose, for a landlord who all of a sudden, through no fault of theirs, find that they're at the receiving end perhaps of a, a breach of contract claim by a contractor. You know, if they, you know, the, the right to manage says, sorry, we're not going to accept, you know, we're disclaiming this contract, we want nothing to do with it. And the contractors, obviously, you know, they, they you know, put the business plan into perhaps work with this right, you know, landlord for I don't know a few years, and find that they, you know, all of a sudden, there are the, the contract is frustrated, but they're not able to, um, you know, sort of issue proceedings for breach of contract because the right managers, in a way, imposed itself on this existing contract. But the the thinking seems to be that right to manage as a concept will um, frustrate any existing contracts. And, and I just uh, mentioned a few sort of consequences of frustration, I suppose, for, for um, some form of completeness here. So it means the contract will be terminated automatically. Um, another consequence of it would be that if there have been advance payments made for services that haven't yet been performed or goods that have not yet been supplied, uh, those advance payments would be recovered. Uh, but if you have if you're in the unfortunate position where, you know, sort of goods have been delivered and they exceed the amount, you know, that have been paid already, then it might be difficult to recover any balance. So a contractor might find themselves exposed to loss in those circumstances because the thinking is that, you know, um, contracts that have already been entered into will be frustrated if the right to manage is applied to a building. It might be useful, I suppose, a practical tip would be, for, I suppose, if you're, you know, sort of dealing with landlords or, or acting for them and they tend to enter into contracts with, you know, companies that do, Exclusively, I suppose, or, or maybe not exclusively, but they do a lot of work with, you know, residential buildings, uh, residential leasehold buildings, to sort of, uh, perhaps if you're entering into contracts for the supply of goods or services to those uh, buildings, to have a clause in the contract that says, okay, um, you know, <laughs> there might be the, the possibility of right to manage, so perhaps we insert something into the contract which preserves our position, so that if right to manage is sort of acquired, then the contractor's um, exposure to loss is, is fairly sort of reduced or minimized. So it might be worth thinking about that, particularly if you've got landlords who do a lot of business with companies um, and, um, and uh, they take care of any eventuality of, of this frustration. So 
just bear that in mind. Now, with the transfer of undertakings, you know, the sort of, uh, just imagine a resident caretaker in the building, um, you know, they've got a contract of employment with the landlord, right to manage them comes into the picture, what happens to them? Again, it's unclear about what their likely position is, but the thinking seems to be that the transfer of undertaking to pay would apply to them. And so the right to manage company may find itself inheriting an employment contract that it may not necessarily want to keep, but would obviously under 2P, they would have to consider that contract and perhaps you know, look for ways of uh, perhaps making them redundant eventually or whatever, paying them off. Again, I would suggest get specialist employment law advice if you find yourself acting for rights managed companies um, in that position of um, you know, employees that you perhaps don't want to take on but may be forced to take on because of the 2P, um, uh, 2P regulations. Now, uh, uh, quite a, a good one, this sort of um, looking at uncommitted service charges, very contentious points, I suppose. I mean, most people, um, most leaseholders, when they go for the right to manage, they're really unhappy with the status quo. We're paying too much in service charges. We want to manage ourselves. This is always a big point about, um, you know, handover. Uh, and what Section 94 says is that any money, service charges, thinking fund uh, contributions, reserve fund contributions, whatever is accrued, so it's there in the kitty, but hasn't been committed to any specific service charge expenditure, has to be paid over to the rights managed company. I mean, that, that's fairly obvious and it does make sense. In any event, it's provided for by Section 94. Now, if there is a dispute about the amounts to be paid over or there's no, you know, you're not able to reach agreement uh, depending on which side of the fence you're sitting on, then an application can be made to the tribunal to sort of determine what the issue is about, you know, what amounts are due and, and, and payable or what amounts represent the sum committed service charges. Now, again, um, this was sort of quite an instructive case, this case of OM Limited and New Riverhead, where basically what had happened was there been ongoing, you know, long-running ongoing disputes between the parties. And, you know, the leaseholders sort of challenged um, service charges at various times. So right to manage was eventually acquired. Um, the right to manage company then sort of issued proceedings in the tribunal to say, look, we, we've got uh, service charge issues here and would like you to tribunal to order that these monies are paid back to us. Um, essentially, these monies were monies that these holders have paid over. So the service charge costs had been incurred. They weren't sitting in the kitty waiting to be uh, committed. They were already committed, but this was following, as I said, long-running disputes about various um, elements of service charges, major works, and all sorts of things. And so the tribunal said, yes, from right to manage company, you are entitled to get this money back, although it had been paid, it wasn't uncommitted. Um, it was committed, as I said, but the tribunal agreed with the leaseholders, and the tribunal even went further to add that interest should be paid at 4% per annum. So the landlord you can imagine how um, furious they were, they applied to the, to the upper tribunal to say, look, these are not uncommitted service charges. They've already been spent. We don't have the money in the kitty, and the FVT didn't even have the power to award interest. Upper tribunal said, well, yes, landlord, you are right. Right to manage company only steps into the shoes of the landlord to the extent of whatever is in the kitty at the date of the transfer. So if, if payments of service charge costs have already been incurred, they crystallize, then, you know, if they're not uncommitted, they have been committed already. And so if a leaseholder was challenging, you know, non you know, reasonable as a service charges, particularly for service charge costs that have already been incurred, they would have to either make an application under Section 27A or go to the, you know, if they were successful with that, they could go uh, to the county court seeking restitution and all that. So, uh, again, this wasn't a matter for the right to manage because those service charges were already committed. What Section um, 94 was referring there to would be service charges that hadn't been committed your reserve fund contribution, your ongoing service charge, which is just said, as I said, in the kitty but not yet utilized. That's what uh, the right to manage company would be entitled to. So, again, just uh, to emphasize that, you know, money that um, the uh, manager actually had, not what they should have had or what they had at some stage but no longer had. I think I like, like that way of putting things. And really, the LBT had no power to award interest, so that was a no go as well. 
So again, just be aware of those sort of when it comes to service charges. Usually quite a big one with right to manage, especially when it's acquired. Um, now the management functions, again, this is key because the whole purpose of leaseholders wanting to get the right to manage is to take over management functions of the building. And these are referred to in 96 and 97 of the 2002 Act. Again, on the acquisition date, those management functions that used to be the landlord's preserve go to the right to manage company. You know, services, repairs, maintenance, improvements, insurance, and general management of the building. Also, and we'll be looking at some more slides that deal with approvals. But I think it's important to note that the right to manage company wouldn't have the right to carry out a service which wasn't already sort of uh, referred to in the lease. So say, for example, you had a lease that didn't um, permit for improvements. You know, the landlord um, can repair, maintain, you know, do all these things to the building, but the landlord didn't have the right to carry out improvements. The right to manage company in those circumstances couldn't carry out improvement work. They've got to restrict themselves to the management functions that are set out under the terms of the lease. Whatever it is the landlord can do is what the right to manage can do. If the landlord is not, if there's no provision in the lease for the landlord to carry out a specific function, the right to manage company won't have the right to carry out that function. I think it goes without saying. Now, with approvals, that's another sort of kettle of fish. And you're looking at, you know, your sort of consent. So, um, carrying out alterations to the property, subletting, assignment perhaps, you know, those got the usual consent that the landlord would have the right to give. Those functions transfer over to the right to manage company once they've acquired the right. But it's not a sort of carte blanche, you know, the, the right to manage company would have to give notice to the landlord of any request that it receives for alterations, consent, or whatever else uh, that is referred to in the lease that requires consent. So again, just some, some sort of um, uh, highlights there from the sections 98 and 99. So it's really sort of, you know, underletting, um, uh, making alterations, et cetera, or changing the use of the tenant's premises. If it's to do with an assignment or underletting or carrying out alterations, then the right to land company is required to give the landlord at least 30 days notice of receipt of the request before it grants an approval. And again, I suppose it gives the, the landlord time to consider the request and, and think whether or not they have objections to raise uh, to the request as well. Um, any other requests which don't fall into the category that I saw on the earlier slide, they must give the landlord at least 14 days um, uh, sort of advance notice of the request. Landlord can object or require the condition should be imposed. And if they do object, then uh, those objections are made uh, to the tenant uh, who's made the request. If there is a dispute about um, you know, what it is that sort of um, leaseholders request it. Say, for example, the leaseholder wants to sublet the property. Um, the landlord says, well, no, I, I don't like you. I don't want to uh, agree to your request. Although the right to manage company has said, yes, we're happy for you to do what you want to do, i.e. sublet the property, then the matter goes to the tribunal for determination if the parties are not able to reach agreement. Um, I think it's important just to emphasize the point that, you know, the right to manage company can only act in accordance with the terms of the lease. So, say, for example, a leaseholder has carried out unauthorized alterations to the property. It's come to somebody's attention, and now they're seeking retrospective consent. Can the right to manage company grant that? retrospective consent, bearing in mind the lease would say, most leases say, that, um, you know, a request, a, a sort of, you, you, you're not allowed to carry out alterations of property without obtaining landlord's prior written permission. Again, the thinking seems to be that in those circumstances, the right to manage company wouldn't have the right to grant uh, retrospective consent because the granting of retrospective consent is not really in keeping with the terms of the lease. It's almost an indulgence by you know, the landlord to say, okay, although you've breached the terms of the lease by doing the alterations without my permission, I'm happy to waive all that and give you permission. So again, just be careful if you're acting for a right to manage company who receives this sort of request for things that have been done contrary to what the lease itself says is that well, what is the extent of power that the right to manage company has? It can only act in accordance with the terms of the lease in terms of 
granting approval. So if it's something which is contrary to the terms of lease, or in this case, if something uh, seeking a retrospective uh, permission, then it's unlikely that the rights managed company will have the right to do so. I mentioned one other thing about management functions. Sometimes, you know, I know that the rights managed company takes over uh, management functions on acquisition date, but it, it, it is possible for it to delegate uh, some of those functions to the landlord. So, say, for example, if the landlord has, you know, sort of gets goods such as at discounted rates on block um, insurance policies, the rights managed company might take a landlord because you get such brilliant rates, although we're not happy with other things that you do, we're happy with the rates that you get for insurance, we'd be happy for you to take on that insurance um, obligation on our behalf. So there is scope uh, for the RTM, the right to manage company, to delegate back some of its functions to the landlord where it considers it's appropriate um, in the circumstances. Now, we're going to be looking at costs of proceedings. It's obviously quite important. I think, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, people are quite excited about taking on management, but sometimes don't quite appreciate that there is a liability that goes with the take on of management functions. Um, so, what the Section 88 is saying is that the RTM is liable for the reasonable costs that are incurred by the landlord, uh, sometimes not just the landlord, the parties, uh, there may be a number of parties to the lease. So, where you've got those sort of tripartite leases, or uh, where there is a tribunal appointed manager in place, the RTM company would be responsible for the costs that are incurred by the landlord in considering the right to manage claim. Now, um, again, those costs have got to be reasonable. So it's not just um, you know, sort of open, you know, open checkbook of costs. It's really that they are reasonable costs uh, that the right to manage company uh, would have to be you know, sort of reimbursing the landlord for. And it's really sort of, um, you know, what, what would the, la if the landlord was paying for those costs, would they be happy to pay for it themselves if it, if it wasn't an obligation of a, you know, rights managed company? That's really the basis for deciding whether or not those costs are reasonable. Um, now, there are also um, cost liability where the claim notice is withdrawn or it's deemed withdrawn or it ceases to have effect. And the claim notice is withdrawn, you know, when you expressly withdraw it. It might be deemed withdrawn. Say, for example, the rights managed company didn't sort of apply to the tribunal on time within the two-month deadline where the validity of the claim notice was challenged or entitlement was challenged, then in those circumstances, the notice would be deemed withdrawn and the rights managed company would be liable for the landlord's reasonable cost. Now, what are reasonable costs? Again, when what I said, I think I sort of jumped the gun a little bit when I explained it to say, look, it's really those costs that, you know, had the landlord been paying for it themselves, they would be liable to pay. So reasonable to that extent um, is what the uh, tribunal would be considering. And it's really the you know, professional services. There's a lot that goes into that, which the next slide uh, sort of uh, deals with. It's really, you know, your legal expenses, solicitor's costs, perhaps the, um, you know, so the, uh, managing agents, accountants have prepared, you know, the uh, accounts or, or transfer of, of monies, um, you know, handing over records, management records, all those kind of things would fall within this bag of professional services. But they've got to be reasonable. I think reasonable is the underlying word. Now, as I said, right to manage, um, I, I sort of alluded to that about the termination of right to manage, and it can take a number of, of um, forms. It might be that the you know, right to manage company expressly withdraw their notice because they realize that, look, sorry, we thought the building was a qualified building, it isn't, there's more than 25% in non-residential use, we're going to expressly withdraw our notice. All the notice has been withdrawn because they forgot to make an application in time to the tribunal. Remember that case we looked at where the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the counter notice, you know, the landlord had, had served a counter notice and right to manage company, you know, within the skin of its teeth, faxed in a, 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 an application form to the tribunal. In those circumstances, if they faxed it in too late, I mean, in that case, slightly different circumstances, but that, that notice will be deemed withdrawn. Or the right to manage company is wound up. You know, companies have this size we're winding you up because you failed to file accounts or there's a, you know, a, a petition of insolvency issued by creditors that could easily sort of end a right to manage company's existence. Or the tribunal, as I said before, decides that the right to manage isn't entitled to right to manage because things haven't been done properly, or it isn't a qualifying building, or they're not enough qualifying lease holders, or whatever the technical points are that are taken, that would end uh, right to manage itself. If right to manage is ended, 
through any of these means, then there's usually a four-year ban before you can set up another rights management company unless the tribunal exercises its discretion to waive the four-year ban and says, okay, in light of perhaps specific circumstances, um, you know, right to manage, you are entitled to um, set up another company and, and get on with it, and we appreciate those circumstances. So, again, unless there's waiver, the rights manager can find itself, you know, dead uh, and, and buried for at least four years before it's able to resurrect itself again. Now, if the, if the notice is withdrawn, you know, right to manage your size, okay, we've withdrawn the notice, then the liability for cost goes, you know, it, it leads really up to the time that the notice is either withdrawn or it ceases to have effect. That's what Section 89, Subsection 2 sort of says. I just wanted to mention something about cost. Again, uh, we'll be looking at it a little bit more, but um, just to be aware that, you know, with cost, um, you know, it's one of those um, cost um, positions where the right to manage, if they did go to tribunal and the landlord was unsuccessful, they couldn't. There's nothing in the statute that says that the landlord um, pays the uh, right to manage cost where the application is unsuccessful with the tribunal, whereas there is that provision in the Act that says, you know, what we've been looking at, 88, 89, that the right to manage company would be liable for the landlord's cost of RTM. But... Um, there is Rule 13, which allows the tribunal itself to award costs, so just be aware of that. Now, where the, um, the application to tribunal is withdrawn, this is quite an instructive case, and we'll sort of uh, dissect it in a little bit. So what had happened was, RTM notified the tribunal of its decision to formally withdraw its application. Okay, we've decided, RTM doesn't apply to us, tribunal, please note that we no longer wish to proceed. The tribunal then on the same date of 12th of November informed the landlord of this um, receipt of, of notification from the RTM. Tribunal also wrote to the RTM to say that, yes, we are confirming that the case has been withdrawn and we have written to the landlord as well. Now, the, the, then there was this cost issue, you know, who's going to be paying our cost because the landlord is saying, okay, although RTM, you did write to the tribunal and tribunal did notify us, you are still responsible for our cost up until the date of, you know, that the, um, the, the sort of matter ceased uh, to exist before the tribunal. And tribunal then decided that the RTM was liable for costs for the period between the date of the claim notice and the date of the application to the tribunal. But they weren't liable for any costs thereafter. Remember, after the date of the application to tribunal, they had written to the tribunal to say, we are withdrawing our claim. And, and the tribunal then went on to say that because the claim was withdrawn with the landlord's consent, the RTM had no further cost liability. But the tribunal said, well, no, that's not the approach to take. Um, a cost liability is statutory. Section 88 says that the RTM is responsible for the landlord's cost. But simply withdrawing an application without more doesn't bring the application to an end. So although the RTM had written to the tribunal, and the tribunal had also written to the landlord, informing the landlord of the, um, the uh, notice by the, uh, the RTM to withdraw its application, that wasn't enough. The tribunal had to formally dismiss the application. And so the cost liability would carry on until the tribunal had formally dismissed the application. And so, you know, just by, you know, again, I think it's instructive for, for people acting for RTMs to know that, look, if you've decided that you're no longer going to proceed, just it's not enough for you to write to the tribunal to say we're no longer going to proceed, that's the end of the matter. No, it has to come to an end, and it, the matter comes to an end when the tribunal itself formally dismisses it by way, I suppose, of, of some form of consent order. Now, if costs are disputed, again, it's an application to the tribunal by either party. I think that goes without saying. Now, again, I think just um, costs obviously being such an important point, we're just going to look at it a little bit more. So, RTM company is only liable for costs incurred in proceedings before the tribunal. If tribunal dismisses, the application for determination, then again, there will be that cost liability. But, you know, it's not enough to say, um, you know, tribunal, we're withdrawing it. The tribunal either 
withdraw, you know, accepts your withdrawal and dismisses the claim, um, so that um, you know they, they, well, they have to do that. I mean, remember that case, um, the one we saw earlier, and then this one, uh, which confirmed that that you can only sort of withdraw the claim with the tribunal's consent. So the tribunal and the tribunal can only consent by formally dismissing the claim. So again, it's really just sort of, I suppose, emphasising this issue about cost because I think people are quite excited to go for the right to manage, but you know, forget that there is a cost liability and that that cost liability can actually carry on uh, for quite a bit of time, even when you've decided that you know we don't want to um, carry on with the right to manage claim or, or whatever else. Um, Again, the tribunal doesn't have the power to award costs of the right to manage company if the landlord fails to resist uh, an application by the company. So just be aware of that. There is also the right under Rule 13, you know, well, Rule 13 of the First Year Tribunal Property Chamber um, for um, the tribunal to award costs where a landlord, or well, not a landlord here, a person, I suppose, I'm a bit sort of landlord unfriendly, I suppose one would say, but no, that was just a slip of the tongue. Um, so Rule 13 does allow the tribunal to award costs where a party has acted uh, unreasonably in bringing, defending, or conducting proceedings, and there could be wasted cost order as well, as well as the reimbursement of the tribunal fees. Um, so in that, remember what I said earlier on, that there's nothing in the Act that gives the, um, the RTA the right to um, you know, sort of request for its costs against the landlord, whereas the, the RTM has the obligation under Section 88 to pay the landlord's reasonable costs. But under Rule 13, there could be an avenue for the RTM to claim its costs where it considers the landlord has acted unreasonably or vexatiously um, in bringing or conducting the proceedings. There's also the opportunity for leaseholders to challenge a landlord's cost under Section 20C of the uh, Landlord and Tenant Act 85. I don't know if you know, but Section 20C um, is a statutory provision that allows leaseholders to ask a tribunal to disapply uh, the service charge recovery clause in the lease where the landlord issues or conducts or defends proceedings. So if there is something in the lease that says landlord would be entitled to recover their costs um, in proceedings, uh, leaseholders could, as part of an RTM claim, say, well, can you disapply that provision in our lease so that the landlord is not able to seek costs against us through the service charges. Now, in those particular decisions, uh, costs were actually awarded by the tribunal against the landlord because uh, although the landlord had um, challenged um, the sort of, um, you know, they sort of left it to the very last minute um, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, withdraw their objection. So it was really the very last minute, and the tribunal said, well, that's really unreasonable behavior. Uh, you shouldn't have waited that long uh, to uh, withdraw your claim, and so, or, or you know, your, your, your um, objections. And so in those circumstances, we're going to award costs against you, and that's exactly what the tribunal did. This was the LBT, mind you. But, you know, with the new regime, the cost powers are much wider. So again, you know, they sort of uh, drop the challenge to the validity of the claim at the very last minute, just before the tribunal hearing. The tribunal wasn't really pleased with that. Now, what are reasonable costs? Again, how should they be assessed? I mean, that's always going to be a matter of fact. You know, what would you pay landlord if you were paying for these costs yourself rather than an RTM company? And in this case, this Pinto uh, case, uh, it, it was agreed by the tribunal that costs are to be assessed, you know, on a standard basis rather than on an indemnity sort of punishing basis. It's really a standard basis for uh, determining costs. So, you know, whatever the civil procedure rules, are on assessment of costs in the civil course, that's what a tribunal would consider as well when they're looking at cost liability. Now, again, I think this is quite important to, to, to emphasize. This recovery of costs extends to all the members of the RTM company. So if someone is considering, you know, setting up an RTM, I think it would be useful to sort of um, make uh, the members aware of the cost liability. You know, again, if you're going to be part of this, there could be, you know, this sort of claim for costs, and sometimes running into the thousands. So, although the right to manage as a concept, you know, is sort of meant to be seen free um, an easy alternative to taking on management responsibilities of the building, it goes without saying that, um, you know, costs would extend to all members of the company if, you know, where it becomes applicable. 
And, you know, even if, you know, say, for example, you know, you sell the, the, the lease on to, to a new person, they might find themselves stung with a cost liability because they've agreed to become a member of the RTM. Uh, and so, you know, it applies even to uh, the mortgages in possession, uh, a trust in bankruptcy, um, even personal representatives where there's been a successful assent. So um, I think it's important um, when you're in any discussion about right to manage uh, to make leaseholders aware of the financial obligation. Clearly, that there's got to be this discussion about look, um, you know, it's all well and good for us to want to take over management of the building, but we could expose ourselves to costs. And so, in that sense, we've got to be prepared um, to expose ourselves to costs, and you know, and and. and obviously pay what is reasonable. I mean, what's reasonable is clearly a matter for the tribunal to determine, but, you know, it's important, I think, I, I can't overemphasize the point about cost, but, you know, something that um, leaseholders must be made aware of if they're considering the right to manage. Uh, I think the last slide says it all. You know, you don't want to end up out of pocket. Um, you know, it's all well and good to get rid of the landlord, but what you don't want is to be out of pocket and, and sort of end up, um, you know, sort of uh, wishing, <laughs> wishing to heaven that you hadn't uh, bothered to participate in the right to manage. So it's always obviously important to, to be aware of the, 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 you know, the right to manage um, liability and responsibilities and, and, and really to consider whether or not at the end of it all, is it really worth it for our type of building? Is it something that we are going to uh, be happy to take on, um, you know, eventually. So all well and good to get rid of the landlord, but, you know, cost obviously is a big issue. Um, and we come to the end of the webinar, some of you <laughs> may be glad to know. But we are going to be taking questions. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Nicholas Kisson, who's uh, going to be helping with some of the questions. So what I would do is invite you to Send in as many questions as you want, and we will, within the next half an hour or so, uh, take as many as we can. There is a, you know, I, I do say that uh, I think at the outset that question could be typed into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. So Nicholas and I are more than happy uh, to take on any questions that you have. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the webinar. And just whilst you're uh, typing away, just to remind you that we've got a webinar on the 11th of October 2016, uh, we're going to be looking at a guide to residential lethal covenants. So you can see that it's, again, chock-a-block with all sorts of topics, uh, paying ground rent, service charges, and all those types of obligations that, you know, you will find uh, that leases have. Sometimes they're, they're surprised to know that they can't keep a pet, even though that's what they really want. Uh, but, you know, I think you, if you tune into that, that would you would find it very beneficial. So um, there's a sort of, um, you know, on the slide you can see the topic. And again, as usual, go to our shop and, and you can sign on to that. Now, Nicholas and I are happy to take your questions and uh, we'll sort of deal with them as you send them in. Thank you. I see a uh, question has come up. I don't know if you want to take this one, Alero. Uh, no, I right think you should take, take it, it, Nicholas. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I've spoken for an hour. I think I should give my voice a little rest. Okay. Take some questions anyway. But, I will uh, do. Oh, all right. These questions come up. Um, I am uh, acting for a right to manage company. Uh, can I... Uh, right to a uh, the, the, the leaseholders building society when there are arrears of service charges. Well, there's nothing to stop you doing that, but uh, if the lender is really switched on, they might say, no, we'll not pay up, because what the lender really uh, fears and, and is worried about and is concerned about is losing lease on which of the flat on which they have security that could happen through forfeiture uh, as you know uh, forfeiture can only be exercised by a landlord so um, it may be uh, a threat uh, that they could perceive as a paper tiger uh, if a switched on lender is aware that the right to manage company doesn't actually have the power to invoke and to pursue forfeiture proceedings Oh, thank you, Nicholas. That's a, that's a good one, uh, I suppose, in terms of uh, the right to manage um, companies' powers. I mean, there is, a, no, obviously, with an hour, we couldn't get into all the topics on, on uh, the sort of uh, taking on management responsibilities. But the right to manage company, just as a, as a comment rather than a question, I suppose I could add to what Nicholas has said, is that the right to manage company, you know, 
as you know, I think we alluded to that in the slides, has a lot of powers, and one of those would be to monitor uh, compliance of covenants. So, again, with that sort of, you know, when you take on the right to manage, there is a duty owed to the landlord to make sure that leaseholders are complying with the terms of the lease, and, it, you know, to take on those, uh, what they call untransferred tenant covenants. So, there are those covenants in the lease that the leaseholder, you know, pay your service charges and do all these things. Uh, where the leaseholder doesn't, then the right to manage company would be within their rights to take action, um, you know, against the leaseholders for, for non-compliance. I just got a question in, and, and it's quite a good question. I don't know if it was something that we touched on in the slide, but uh, I'm going to answer it anyway. The question is about um, service charge arrears. So um, you're saying if the landlord is owed service charges, can the RTM claim those service charge arrears from the leaseholder, or is the right to claim the arrears, this is before the acquisition date, I'm presuming, is that right preserved to the landlord? The answer to that question is yes. Where there are service charge arrears before the right to manage acquisition date, you know, the date of determination that we sort of I banged on about uh, in the slides, before that acquisition date, then it is the landlord who's entitled to all the service charges owed up to the date that the right to manage is acquired. So the right to manage would really sort of find itself in a, in a tight corner if it then started to claim uh, service charge arrears from, from non paying leaseholders before the acquisition date. The landlord would still be entitled. Unless the landlord has said, yes, right to manage, I'm quite happy to delegate this responsibility to you and you can act on my behalf to claim those arrears, it will be a matter for the right to manage, um, sorry, the landlord uh, to claim the arrears and not the right to manage. The right to manage company's entitlement to service charges only start to flow from the date of acquisition and not before. So I think that's a good point. Um, thanks for that question because it's sort of something that does come up a lot when, when leaseholders contact us about, you know, the right to manage and arrears. So good, good, good question there. Can you keep the questions coming in, please? Because, you know, we're sort of clearly are here to answer them. Okay, uh, it's another question. Is it? Do you want to take this one, Leroy? Oh, Nicholas, uh, I think you should take it. I've just taken one. All right. Okay. Um, somebody's asked, um, uh, acting for a landlord who has successfully resisted a uh, right to manage claim at the uh, first tier tribunal property chambers. I engage solicitors and barristers uh, to uh, help with resisting the claim. Uh, can I recover those uh, professional fees through the service charges? Well, I. The short answer is probably not. I, I, I'm not aware of any case of upper tribunal, lands chamber or above that's tested this, but I'd be surprised. Now, the first thing we always tell clients when they ring up lease for advice is, what's in your lease? You know, what does it cover? You know, if you're asking to pay towards gardening, what does it cover? And uh, when it comes to professional fees, there have been lots of cases, um, some taking a restrictive and some taking a more liberal interpretation of various provisions in the lease, such as sweeping up clauses or sweeper clauses, all those costs relating to estate management, etc., um, that um, they then want to uh, argue should be recoverable through the service charges as extending to professional fees such as solicitors and barristers. I'd be very surprised if such a clause, unless it was explicitly worded as such, and I'd be very surprised if such an explicitly worded clause appeared in a lease, but I'd be very surprised if such a sweeping up clause about costs of management, etc., or even costs of engaging professionals, extended to the cost of resisting a right to manage claim. Um, but I haven't seen it tested yet. I seem to recall that there was a case, I think it might have been a jam factory in Conway, uh, about resisting, <coughs> about recovering costs for resisting appointment of a manager. Um, but I'm not aware of a cost uh, recovering professional fees for resisting a right to manage claim. I'd be very surprised <coughs> if those costs were recoverable. <coughs> Okay, uh, thanks, Nicholas, for that. Um, you know, I suppose we're all sort of um, waiting for more questions. I seem to have uh, a comment here, not so much a question, uh, but a comment on, on negative counter notices. And, you know, it's really this sort of point about, uh, you know, if you're 
referring a negative counter notice, to what extent do you have to rely on the statutory provisions of the Act, the 2002 Act, where you're looking at serving a negative counter notice? So, quite an important comment to make because there is a case, uh, this case of Asset Hole Limited um, against. 14 Stansfield Road RTM Company Limited, where the landlord had challenged um, entitlement to RTM, but when they sought the counter notice, they failed to provide the specific reference in the 2002 Act to the, the, the um, you know, to determine the challenge, and the up tribunal held that the counter notice was invalid because, although it identified the 2002 Act, it failed to identified the section of the Act with which it um, alleged that the right to manage company had failed to comply. And so, um, you know, it's not enough, I suppose a lesson to be learned there that is, that it's not enough just to, you know, contend that the claim notice is not valid or non-compliant with, you know, Common Hold and Lisa Reform Act 2002. You, you know, the landlord who was trying to resist the claim, you've got to be specific in identifying what part of the Act deals with your objection. So if it was, say, for example, to do with the fact that the landlord didn't consider that the, you know, when we were looking at St. James and St. Stephen mansions, you know, those cases about, you know, part of the building and all that, if the landlord said, well, sorry, but, you know, if you brought a claim for part of the building and, and the landlord said, well, sorry, but this is not vertically, um, you know, it's not properly divided vertically and so the building isn't a qualifying building, then you've got to refer to the specific portion of the 2002 Act dealing with, you know, the sort of um, right to manage for, uh, you know, premises to which this chapter applies. In that particular example I've just given, it would be Section 72. So if the landlords are saying, well, sorry, but, um, you know, your right to manage is not uh, uh, sort of one that uh, the Act applies to because Section 72 and you set out, you know, all those things, then that would sort of be a valid counter notice as opposed to one that says, sorry, your premises are not qualifying because they don't comply with Common Hold and Lease of Reform Act 2002. So again, just be aware of, you know, I know sometimes the detail of right to manage is quite pedantic and, and um, quite sort of specific, but then right to manage has generated a lot of, I think, the, you know, apart from service charges, right to manage seems to be, you know, sort of up there with, uh, you know, objections that are raised by, by landlords. And it's understandable, you know, if a landlord is resisting the right to manage, they will take each and every point, uh, bearing in mind what I said about uh, the determination date being further um, uh, sort of uh, advanced where, um, you know, there's a dispute and, and that sort of delays the, you know, the acquisition of the right to manage. So I think it will be important to make sure that these, uh, you know, the sort of detail, while they seem quite pedantic, um, that you are sort of familiar with them and, and you, when you do sort of um, complete your counter notices, make sure that they are to, sort of uh, properly completed and not susceptible to challenge by the right to manage company. So I hope that satisfied uh, sort of that comment to a question. I mean, it was more a comment, but then it sort of, in a way, I suppose, was a question as well. Thank you. Okay. Keep the questions coming. Mm -hmm. We're happy to take... Um, you know, many questions so we can fit into the remainder of the time that we have. Right. Um, somebody's asked a question about appointment of a manager. We don't actually cover appointment of a manager in this webinar, but do you want to, are you prepared to take the question on appointment of a manager? I think I'm just taking a question. I think you should take it. No, but I'm wondering, should we take this question that somebody's raised? Oh, right. right. Uh, I apologise. I don't see why not. I mean, it's all part of the, um, I suppose, the, well, the, the, this uh, questioner is saying that they're considering the options of mm -hmm. point of manager and um, right to manage, particularly um, it's a mixed-use building with a bit of commercial and residential flats above shops and offices. Right. Um, what, what this, this, this question is saying is that um, they want to know if, um, on a point of a manager, are they going to cover the, is the manager, can the manager cover the whole building, uh, including the commercial part? Well, there was some case law, it was Queen something, um, on the upper tribunal, Landers Chamber, I haven't got it to hand, but um, earlier this year, I believe, that said that um, they could take over the commercial part and in fact, use the rent collected, the um, uh, manager appointed by the tribunal, to um, run the building. Um, I'm happy to uh, 
discuss that one offline and um, refer the inquirer to the uh, case in question if they want to get in touch with me uh, offline. Fine. So, Nicholas, sorry, your point in that, with that question is that we've, if you've got a mixed-use building, then rather than, you know, where right to lunch may not be um, sort of suitable, particularly yeah. if the building isn't a qualifying one because you've got perhaps uh, commercial being more than 25% of the internal floor area, the appointment of a manager might be a useful alternative yeah. to that. I'm just going to touch on this uh, question about appointment of a manager. I think it's quite a useful one because with the um, with the right to manage, um, where the, where the landlord um, you know could have sees that the right to manage has been acquired, but the right to manage company isn't sort of living up to expectation, isn't looking up to the building as it should. What are the management alternatives? And just tying in with that issue of appointment of a manager, that would be one of them. So there's nothing to stop the landlord, you know, going off to a tribunal to make an application for the appointment of a manager to manage a building because the right to manage company has failed in its duty to properly manage a building. I think that's why it, you know, sort of ties in with the sort of comment, if you like, about the appointment of the manager as a useful alternative um, to uh, the right to manage. It would even also be deployed where the right to manage ceases to exist because, say, for example, it owes a debt uh, and the creditors have petitioned company's house and the right to manage has been struck off or, or wound off or whatever. Then, the, um, bear in mind what I said about a four-year time delay unless the tribunal waives that requirement, the appointment of the manager could be a useful alternative in those circumstances to the right to manage. So, um, that's sort of, a, Nicholas, your question has led into, I suppose, more discussions about the appointment of the manager as a viable alternative to uh, the right to manage. Thanks for that comment. That was very useful. Uh, please keep the questions coming in. We've still got a, a you know sort of uh, ten or so minutes left to to take them on. Um, so if somebody's asked a question, mm -hmm. um, does the exercise of right to manage have any implications for a collective enfranchisement? Uh, I wonder if you could take that one. I mean, there are alternatives, I suppose. I mean, with the right to manage, you're looking more at taking on management responsibilities rather than ownership, not rather than, you know, sort of owning the building. I suppose that would be one distinction. But there's nothing to stop a right to manage company, um, once they have acquired the right to manage, to use that vehicle for the purpose of buying the freehold in future. If that is the case where the right to manage is used as the, the vehicle for buying the, the freehold interest, it ceases to be a right to manage company and becomes a freehold company. So there's nothing to stop, uh, you know, sort of uh, right to manage being exercised um, and then thereafter going for the freehold. That just brings me up to another point about right to manage and buying the freehold. They can't, they, we, we have seen cases here at the tribunal, uh, the leasehold advisory service, where some leaseholders um, own the freehold in a building, and then yet others set up a right to manage company um, to take on management responsibilities. So you can have that odd scenario where not everyone is a member of the freehold company, and not everyone is a member of the right to manage. And there can be sort of, you know, sort of bugbears going on there because, you know, perhaps there's all sorts of disputes about how the building has been run, managed, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can have those sort of, um, I suppose, um, uncomfortable situations exist. But, you know, nothing to stop a uh, right to manage and freehold ownership coexisting in the building with different members. Although, if the right to manage, as I said, is used to buy the freehold, then that company ceases to be a right to manage for the purpose of the 2002 Act. So I hope that's answered that question uh, fairly clearly. Please keep the questions coming in. Um, we're happy to take them. Okay. Um, somebody's asked about Section 20 consultation. Right. Um, a bit random, that, with the um, right to manage. But I'm, I'm happy for us to take any questions. Well, this is, um, from what I can see, this question is actually to do with Section 20 consultation by right to manage. Oh, right. Okay. Companies. So that's useful. Um, <laughs> Well, what they want to know is, uh, let me just read this question okay, a okay. bit closer. Yeah. Um, I um, am acting for a right to manage company. We're about to send out Section 20 consultation notices. Um, are there going to be any implications if we uh, get it wrong? Well, yeah. I mean, implications are that um, unless you get a dispensation, uh, 
order from uh, the appropriate tribunal, which will be the first tier tribunal property chamber in England and the leasehold valuation tribunal in Wales, then um, if it's uh, for qualifying works, major works, then it's £250 per leaseholder and the right to manage company could be stuffed, to uh, put it colloquially, and may uh, end up being put in voluntary liquidation by its creditors. Um, I could envisage scenarios and I understand from anecdotal evidence in early days with contractors that um, when there were right to manage companies involved, uh, that they were asking for some personal guarantees from directors, which they were reluctant to give. Uh, but yeah, it's the same implications and it could be grave implications for right to manage companies um, uh, that uh, get it right on consultation or for, get a dispensation order or face the financial consequences. Thanks, Nicholas, for that. Very useful, um, I suppose, for, for the audience to, to be uh, aware of that. Um, I've just got one question here, and that's quite a good one, about, uh, in a way, the sort of management functions. Um, someone's asking, you know, they act for uh, a right to manage company. The landlord has decided to, you know, the right to manage was recently acquired, I think, um, on the on the question, it says that right to manage was acquired on the 1st of September. So <laughs> fairly uh, recently. And the landlord is insisting on insuring the building, um, even though there is a right to manage. And although the landlord didn't particularly object to the right to manage being acquired, they're saying that, well, as part of their block portfolio, they want to insure the building. Can they do this? Well, the short answer to that is no. From their position date, the right to manage company takes on all those management functions that I sort of alluded to in the slides. And that would include functions relating to insurance of the building. So I think you'd be um, quite safe to sort of say to the landlord as the managing agent that um, it's the right to manage company's uh, right uh, to insure the building and, now, and that that right has been overtaken by the acquisition date, which in your case is 1st of September. So I think, you know, I would, I would write back to the landlord in those words and then I would also quote from the statutory provisions, you know, section, I think it's section 94 that deals with the sort of uh, takeover of management functions, well, sorry, not 94, 96 to 97. Um, that deals with that. So I would also just refer to that in my letter to say, look, under this statutory provision, landlord, the right to manage acquires uh, management responsibilities from the acquisition date or the date of determination, depending on what would apply to you. Um, so you'd be well within your right to sort of resist that attempt by the landlord to carry on insuring the building once the right to manage has come into play. So I hope that sort of um, satisfied your question. Thank you. All right, I can't see any more questions. Um, we'll wait a few more minutes and uh, see if any more questions, and then we'll uh, call it a day. But uh, yeah, feel free uh, to send in the questions. Uh, otherwise, um, if something comes to you afterwards, then uh, do feel free to get in touch with Alero. I must warn you, though, that whilst we're not trying to sort of make a lot of money, but if you do bring in a professional, I mean, obviously, if it was something related to the webinar, we'd be, um, I'd be more than happy to answer it. But if it was a, you know, sort of separate professional request, then um, Lise now does charge a fee um, to respond to professional requests. So um, you can go on our website and, and fill in the forms and, and submit your inquiry. But just be aware that if it's not specifically related to today's webinar, then there will be a fee, uh, I'm afraid, to respond to it. Thank you. Okay. So we've got time for a few more, perhaps one or two more questions. Uh, please feel free to answer, ask them, and uh, we'll sort of do our best to answer you. But waiting for questions just before we, um, we call it a day, call it an afternoon, I suppose.
But whilst we're waiting for a question, I, I will be uh, grateful if um, you can all respond to a survey that will be sent out uh, subsequently today after the webinar comes to an end. It just helps us to keep up with the quality of the service that we provide. Um, usually you would have completed that online, but it is, um, well, as I said, the webinar was sort of coming to an end, but the link is broken, so we'll be sending you a um, sort of um, subsequent survey, and I'll be grateful for people to complete that and, and return it to us so that we can, you know, obviously review and, and see what, what improvements we need to do, and just, you know, clearly to invite your, your comments and observations about the webinar that I've delivered today. Thank you very much for that, so for responding to that. Thank you. Someone just asked a question, and it's quite an interesting one. Um, they know that um, in order to serve the claim notice, um, half the number of flats in the building need to be members of the right to manage company. But what happens when the right to manage is acquired? Is it possible um, for people to drop out so that you have less than half the number of flats um, as members of the right to manage? Will that affect the right to manage company in any way? Uh, the short answer to that is no. So the, 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 I suppose the, the critical date would be on the date that the notice is, the claim notice is served. On that date, uh, there should be at least half the number of qualifying flats um, as members of the RTM. But if after that date or when RTM is acquired, uh, people start to fall off like flies, clearly that's not desirable, but it can happen then it's not going to affect um, you know, the validity of the RTM as a company uh, set up for the purpose because you know, the Act itself makes it clear that it's the acquisition date that um, membership, uh, eligible, well, membership criteria is confirmed rather than the sort of post, um, uh, sorry, the date of service of the claim notice rather than any other post service of claim notice event. So uh, I hope that sort of clarified that in terms of uh, you know, membership of the company. Clearly, it's not ideal for people to drop off because then you've got to consider costs and things like that. It might be worth, I know it's not something that I've emphasized before, but it might be worth entering into a participation agreement. Um, I know that, you know, there will be something in the, in the company's articles about, uh, you know, tying the members to um, having a contribution to, to the affairs of the company. But it might be worth entering into a participation agreement where, you know, leasehold members of the RTM are then tied into, you know, sort of supporting the RTM in terms of cost. Which leads me, I think, to the last question today, which I will take, Nicholas, if that's all right with you. Yeah. It's about the, the, the running costs and overheads of the RTM. Can they be recovered through the service charges? Unfortunately not. Um, those costs, the running costs, um, of the RTM, you know, filing fees and any costs associated with the right to manage the company uh, will be limited to the members of the company. And, and that can be a bit frustrating, I can, I can imagine, because if you've got leaseholders who are not members of the RTM but who are obviously benefiting from the acquisition of the RTM, they're not going to be exposed to a cost liability for running the RTM, although they're getting all the benefits. But then if you try to recover the cost of, you know, your running cost as a service charge, then at least other could, you can imagine them, uh, you know, putting in a, an application to the Tribunal under Section 27A of the Landlord and Tenant Act, 1985, asking for a determination of the reasonableness of those costs because, uh, and again, their argument would be premised on the fact that, well, it's not a service charge cost. It's an RTM overhead cost. So, and I think they'd be, you know, sort of, um, they'd be uh, right in that regard if they if they do challenge it. So, unfortunately, the overheads associated with um, being a member of the RTM and, and, and the running costs associated with the RTM providing its services will not be ones that would be recoverable through the service charges. So, it'll be more a cash call, um, if you like, on the members of the RTM. I hope that answers that question. Right, Nicholas, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, I don't think we have either. Yeah, so, so we're, we're, getting, we're getting close to the end anyway. Yeah. So, 
Thanks everyone for listening in on you know to the um, part two of the RTM webinar. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it. And as I said, there is uh, the next webinar is on the 11th of October. Um, hopefully, you, as many of you who've tuned in today will tune into that one as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.